In the year 400, Britain had been Roman for three centuries. With towns and roads crisscrossing the island, Roman control must have seemed like a fact of life. By the year 500, the cultural map of Britain was unrecognisable. Ideas about Rome and the Latin language were commonplace in Gaul, Hispania and Italy, and there they formed the centrepiece around which post-Roman kingdoms shaped themselves. But in Britain, these ideas were uprooted. The east coast of Britain believed that they'd come from Scandinavia, people that we call Anglo-Saxons. They spoke a Germanic language and shared more of a bond with the Germanic world than with the former Roman Empire. The main question though has to be, why? In 400 AD, Britain was no different to the rest of the empire in its acceptance of Roman rule and its adoption of Roman culture. Why, in only a century, had Latin and Roman behaviour almost entirely disappeared from the British Isles. The amassing of land and wealth by Roman landowners occurred throughout the Western Roman Empire. Their control of local economies and governments superseded Roman control, leading to the de facto breaking up of the Roman Empire. This happened in Gaul, Hispania and Western Britain, but this did not happen in Eastern Britain. Under Rome, Eastern Britain was heavily Romanized. It had heavy military presence and featured many villas, cities and roads, increasing its population, all of whom needed food and luxury goods. These people also competed for land, increasing its price beyond its productive capacity, meaning that as an investment, expensive land in Eastern Britain was just not worth accumulating. It didn't grow enough food for a quick return on investment, so many just didn't bother collecting it. This by itself is not special, Land in Italy was absolutely extortionate due to its proximity to Rome, but Britain was a peripheral island. The imports Britain needed to support the population came in vast quantities and came entirely by boat. When the Roman state and economy faltered and trade slowed, a more self-reliant area could fall back on its large-scale landowners and their production. But Eastern Britain had almost none of these. Eastern Britain was left not with dozens of kingdoms, but with thousands of small-scale landholding families. By the year 425, a quarter of the inhabitants of Britain remembered a Roman world clearly. Some, in their adolescence, had poised themselves to embrace an empire's worth of opportunity. These opportunities were no longer there. At around the same time, ragtag collections of Germanic people began to come ashore in Eastern Britain. Their arrival was not a planned singular exodus, an army, or an invasion force. Very few, if any of them, carried weapons. It was a sputtered and sporadic movement of people, leaving the Germanic world for any number of countless reasons. Their experience was as stark a contrast to the post-Roman Britons as could be. There is only a distant chance that they had even heard of Rome. They certainly had no first-hand experience of it. In fact, they had never seen a town and they had never used money. They sought land for farming and forests for their pigs to rummage. The lawless world of Eastern Britain presented this opportunity as there was no one to contest a land claim. Anyone with the ability to travel and a want for land could claim it. The land that they settled was poor quality, so much so that the grains they planted had worn down their teeth, but it was better than owning no land at all. With the arrival of Germanic settlers, some British natives on the east coast now shared their local areas. They lived no further than 10 miles away from the new arrivals. Interaction was inevitable between them, but it was rarely hostile. Robin Fleming in Britain After Rome writes that, more often than not, the native Britons and Germanic settlers talked to one another and settled next to one another. British peasants may have preferred immigrant agriculturalists to land-hungry villa owners, the newcomers and natives married one another's womenfolk, and they were buried in the same new cemeteries. Their ideas about the world and their own personal identity were becoming shared. Families with a Germanic parent and a British parent had to, of course, choose a primary language for their children. They chose the Germanic language, unknowingly beginning the process of ethnogenesis the birth of new identities, which centred around emphasising their Germanic heritage. The languages they spoke, the stories they shared, the gods they praised, and how they did all of this, was Germanic. 
but we can't forget that it was also influenced by the British landscape and by native Romano-Celtic inhabitants. As this was going on, wealth was shifting. Wealth was spread unequally from the beginning in minor ways. Some owned fertile land, and for others, the land could barely sustain them. Some had large families and could farm more land, and others had no children, so they couldn't. Some were willing to bully, and others were willing to be bullied. Some collected debts, and others were indebted into slavery. Within a few generations, these barely detectable differences in wealth had become large, and a class had emerged at the top who no longer needed to work their land themselves. They could command surpluses of food to buy luxury goods and show off their standing. After a century of cultural change, what were once thousands of land holdings had become a handful of kingdoms that we recognise. Kent, Essex, East Anglia, Lindsay, Deira and Benicia. Eastern Britain was again a land of government, but it was a land of Germanic government. How would these people have identified themselves? There was no overarching sense of Englishness yet. This wouldn't exist for another 200 years, and wouldn't be fostered in a way that we would recognise for half a millennium. We would start to recognise them and their governments as Anglo-Saxon, but this is not a term that they would have used. We think that they may have regarded themselves as Angles, Saxons or Jutes, believing that they stemmed from three tribes back in Denmark. But this reflects more about their believed heritage than it does about their actual identities. Ultimately, their identities were entirely defined by the political boundaries established by their king. These were the people with which they met, feasted and communicated regularly. It's only natural that people would, after meeting their king and countrymen, foster a sense of identity. Britain found itself in a confusing situation. Changes in culture over a century are more or less invisible. How was this invisible cultural change explained? We already know the answer to this. It was believed that military conquest was to blame. And even now, in this very comment section, I'm sure people are perpetuating this myth. Gildas is our only contemporary source for this period. Gildas wrote that after Rome, the British were ruled by a singular king, Vortigern. To protect his kingdom from invaders from the north, Vortigern invited fierce and impious Saxons who came from the east, inviting more of their friends and demanding more resources, before they betrayed them, burning churches and driving the British westward. This is similar to other accounts. Bede, writing in the 8th century, wrote on the northeast coast. He gives us the names Hengist and Horsa, who arrived in 449, but otherwise he gives a similar account, that of Germanic conquest driving Britons westward. Over centuries, other similar accounts emerge. History of the Britons in the 9th century, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the 10th, and the history of the Kings of Britain in the 13th. Each one of these gives us more detail than the last, giving explicit conquests, battles and names, but we've yet to find any archaeological evidence to back any of these claims up. There is no evidence for King Vortigern, for Hengist or Horsa, for genocide, for burned churches, for the vast movements of Britons from east to west seeking refuge. Without a shred of evidence to back these claims, we can't trust these accounts blindly. They had every reason not to know what happened, and even what they did know, they had every reason to skew towards a narrative. All of them were influenced by Gildas, so we'll look at him and his account more closely. Gildas was an incredibly religious writer. He clarifies time and again that Germanic arrivers were not only pagans, but that they were loathsome of Christianity. His writing allures not only to these events, but equally to religion, the Bible and biblical scripture at every opportunity, which at times makes his writing impossible to understand. For pagans to gain wealth, and for Christians to be converted, would be, for monks like Gildas, absolutely unthinkable. By referring to scripture, Gildas hoped to draw on historical parallels of pagan success, and from this, he surmised that God must have been angry at the Romano-British for their greed. In a Christian worldview, this was the only viable explanation. God would not have let truly pious Christians be overrun by pagans. Bede's account is influenced by this, but he provides us with more information. The names Hengist and Horsa, and the accounts of their defeat of Vortigern, were stories told in Eastern Britain. Stories of island-wide conquest are not only entertaining, 
but they serve a purpose of legitimization. They can be used to justify a king's place, uphold his kingdom, perpetuate his dynasty, justify his conflicts and to create local identities. This applied for British kings in the West as well. Kings in Kent trace their ancestry back to Hengist, and kings in Powys trace their ancestry back to Vortigern. The story of mass hostile immigration driving Britons westward is nothing but propaganda. For the church, it explained a phenomenon of them losing influence in an area, and for kings, it legitimised their position, and it proved why they and their people were right to hold their land. So, if it wasn't through conquest, or through cultural superiority, then the question remains, why did the Germanic culture thrive and perpetuate in Britain? Why did Bernicia, Deira, Lindsay, East Anglia, Essex or Kent not speak a Latin or Britonic language? And why were the new arrivals, while small in number, so fundamentally influential on Eastern Britain? The Germanic people were no strangers to sailing. They coasted along the North Sea to find Britain, after all. This is a long journey, but it isn't a difficult one. The water currents help. They create highways of water flow, which carry boats to Britain and back with little effort. Further, the North Sea is shallow, and in the stormiest of weather, it remains comparatively calm. The North Sea provided skilled migrants, craftsmen, fighters and material goods. All of these were the same things that Roman trade used to provide. Britain itself also had three major water systems, which allowed for travel deep inland. The Humber, the Wash and the Thames. These would define the boundaries of the emergent kingdoms. They would act as economic and cultural arteries which connected the Germanic kingdoms to their perceived homeland. Thirdly, Eastern Britain is low-lying and fertile land. It's easy to farm, to traverse for trade, for communication and for war. These factors added together made Britain more than merely a former Roman province. John Blair states that Eastern Britain was, culturally, the westernmost reaches of Scandinavia. By contrast to the West, where Germanic influence did not spread in the 5th and 6th centuries, movement was hard. There was the Irish Sea, which provided cultural contact between Ireland, Cornwall, Wales and Scotland, majorly informing Welsh and Cornish identities and likely leading to a decline in Roman influence which had survived into the 5th century. But there was only one major river system, the Severn, which did not flow from the east, it flowed from the north. The land to the west was also, a short distance inland, very hilly and not particularly fertile. The Romans had paved a system of roads, however 20 years after Roman collapse, these lay in major states of disrepair. They could be used for short distance travel, but not for quick travel between east and west. The east was in constant cultural contact with Scandinavia, but similar contact westward was incredibly difficult. To British families in the East, the tides of history were turning. The landscape itself worked against the survival of British culture. The cards were dealt, and the Germanic culture had, in the East, invariably won. Germanic kingdoms were established in the British Isles. They had not gained this land through conquest, but through a mixture of a convoluted series of decisions and geographical look. Thanks for watching. This video was really difficult to produce. This topic is hugely complicated, especially to summarise it down into a quarter of an hour. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate it if you were to share it with your friends or in communities who would like to learn more about this topic or this period. This is a big ask from such a small YouTuber, but the amount of time taken to research, collate, explain and animate this topic has made it, for huge amounts of time, very frustrating. If this does well, I can justify making more videos like this and about this topic in the future. Again, thanks.